Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about the exam problems. Um, I noticed on this problem, and I warned you that we have problems like this comparing molecules, and to be really careful uh, about the relationships between molecules, uh, that there were still quite a few problems that people had doing this. So I want to go through these, um, how I would go through them and show you uh, maybe where you might have made mistakes and what you're looking at. Uh, so if you look at the first problem there, uh, letter A, <clears throat> okay, these are two molecules that are listed here, and you notice the only difference is the position of the double bond is on the left side of the ring here and on the right side of the ring here. Okay, so it almost looks like a mirror image, right? But why is it not a mirror image? Well, the actual stereo centers, if it were a mirror image, if you think about uh, a mirror in between those, right? This o OH that's going down should be reflected here, and those OHs are not in the same orientation. This OH going up should be reflected over here to that OH, and that's not going up, that's going down. Okay, so it's not obviously not a direct mirror image. Okay, what's the best way to figure out the relationship between these molecules? Look at the configurations and the R and S configurations and compare them. So if we look at this molecule on the left, we have um, two stereocenters, right? Uh, and this one, what's the configuration of the stereocenter there? One, two, Three, and the hydrogen's going down, so that would be the S stereochemistry. Okay, and then the other stereocenter for the alcohol here, okay, the hydrogen is coming up, so it's one, two, three. That stereocenter is also S, right? So this is the SS. Okay, and what is it for the other molecule? that we're comparing it to. It's the same, it's S and S. So the alcohol closest to the double bond is still S, this alcohol is still S, so those molecules are exactly the same. And they're identical molecules. Um, it almost looks like a mirror image, but I didn't switch to stereochemistry as well, so those were not reflected as a mirror. So those are identical. The next molecule, um, is a mirror image, and you can see if you just look at it directly, everything on the left side is reflected over to the right side, right? And if you look at the configuration, we start with the, uh, again, the S configuration on the left, and it becomes R on the right. Okay, so that is, in fact, a pair of enantiomers. Okay? Uh, the next two, the next two look um, interesting, and again, these are examples of molecules where I've changed the orientation of the carbon back home, right? So that's one clue to make you realize that you should look carefully at the configuration of, this, of the specific centers. Um, so if you look at uh, C, the one on the left, we have the R and the S configuration. And the one next to it on the right is the S and the R configuration. Okay. Um, but are they mirror images? No, they're just actually identical molecules. Because it's symmetric, you can you can number the molecule uh, from either end of the carbon chain, so you have a two R three S. Uh, it depends on how you number the chain. So this actually is an identical set of molecules, and this happens to be the one that is meso. If you look at the mirror plane, if particularly in the orientation I've drawn it there, the molecule itself can be bisected by a mirror plane. So this is the, the one that is actually containing uh, meso molecules. Okay, and finally this one, 
we have the S stereochemistry, and the S stereochemistry in this one is R and, uh, sorry, is that, that's R and S, right? So what's the relationship? Diastereomers. One of the stereocenters is the same, the other one has been switched. It's not a direct mirror image, it's not RR, so it has to be a diastereomer. Okay. Any questions on this? I imagine on the final there will be a similar kind of problem, and uh, it probably will include more examples of constitutional isomers and resonance forms and things like that. So we're going to combine all these relationships probably into one, one problem, so be prepared for that. I know, it's good, huh? Okay, here uh, another one. I think people did pretty well on this. Um, this is a complicated molecule, and actually this is a real example of a molecule, which is an important molecule. Uh, and there are many stereocenters in there, and fortunately for you, I only picked four of you to four of them to figure out. So, uh, in this case, um, I don't think it was too difficult to see the priorities because each of these stereocenters had some atom attached to it that was um, a high atomic number, higher atomic number than carbon, and all of them had a hydrogen on it, so it's just a matter of figuring out the priorities of the other two groups. Um, which, hopefully you saw for this one, is one, two, and three. The hydrogen going down, so that would be the R configuration. For the one on the right, it's one, two, and three. The hydrogen is going down, so that's also R configuration. Uh, let's see, where's the next one here? So in this case, we have oxygen, uh, obviously number one. Uh, we have a carbon attached to oxygens or a carbon attached to nitrogen. The one attached to oxygen is our higher priority. Okay, so that is R. Hydrogen is pointing up, remember, so you have to be careful with that one. So that's also R, and the last one, one, two, three, going clockwise, the hydrogen pointing up, that one has to be S. Okay, any problems doing that? If you want more practice, go and assign the stereocenters, uh, the configurations for all the other stereocenters. I know you go home at night and uh, just want to do that, right? I know, I know. <clears throat> okay, I think uh, uh, one of these questions uh, caught people a little off guard. Maybe I didn't cover it enough in class, but uh, just to go through these. This is talking about substitution reactions um, and elimination reactions and whether these are true or false. So an SN1 substitution proceeds over two steps, and that's... True, yes. You form a carbocation and then you add the nucleophile in the second step. In E2 elimination, hydrogen and the leaving group have to be anti periplanar That's 180 degrees apart on adjacent carbons, right? Yes, we need that alignment for the one step elimination reaction to proceed, so that's true. Um, and SN2 often competes with E1. Generally, if you're going to do, if you're going to form a carbocation to do an E1 elimination, it's going to compete with the other carbocation process, which would be the SN1. So SN2 competes with E2, SN1 competes with E1, generally. Um, so an SN2 substitution isn't under acidic conditions, it's usually under a strong nucleophile or more basic conditions to do the direct SN2, so there's no way you'll have carbocations generated generally under those kinds of conditions. So that's false. Um, SN2 substitution is one step. It goes with inversion of configuration. And I think this last one people weren't very sure about. In substitutions or eliminations, either one, we're talking about the leaving group. Iodine is a better leaving group than a chloride. 
It's about how weak the bond is, right? The iodide bond is weaker because iodide is bigger and the bond's longer. Remember we talked about the leaving group ability of the halogens, that the iodide is more reactive. Whether we're talking about a substitution or an elimination, um, it doesn't really matter because both of them involve breaking that bond. So that's that was true. I think a lot of people put false for that. But that one was true. Okay. Okay, draw the structures for these names. Um, and you had to know a little bit about the stereochemistry and be able to draw them. Uh, and a couple of the pitfalls I see often in these kinds of naming problems and drawing structures from them, I did see show up here, so just to, uh, I'll remind you of some of those. Um, this first one, um, on your exam, that was a two, and I, I corrected it during the exam and said that should be one chloro. Um, I know a couple of you didn't get that correction, and I didn't uh, ding you for that. Um, but uh, if we're going to do this one chloro, by the way, if that's the 2-chloro-2-methylbutane, that would look like this. And what's the problem with S2-chloro-2-methylbutane? That's not a stereocenter. There is no RRS. That's why that was a, a mistake. Um, so if we actually look at the one that I intended, the one we corrected during the exam, 1-chloro-2-methylbutane, uh, that means you have the chlorine on the number one carbon. So there's four carbons. Chlorine on the number one carbon. And by the way, if chlorine is on the number one carbon, uh, there are two hydrogens. That's also not a carbon. That carbon is not a stereocenter. That has two hydrogens on it. So showing bold or dashed lines on that carbon really is meaningless. It doesn't say anything. The stereocenter is actually at the two position where the methyl group is attached. And we want the, what did I say, S stereochemistry. So we have a methyl group attached here. Okay, methyl group, that means there's also one hydrogen on that carbon as well. So if you want the S configuration, does the methyl group have to be up or down? It has to be up the way I've drawn it this way. Okay, so that should be drawn, showing the stereochemistry at that position, because that's, and I'll draw the hydrogen to show you. That's the stereocenter made different by having the chlorine here versus the CH3 there, the different groups. I think you had a problem on the homework that had something similar. Why is this one chiral? That maybe it was one of those that you had difficult doing. Complicated, if you do this reaction, you get this, and if you did this reaction, you get this. Um, but notice that the carbon that the chlorine's on, that was a common mistake, uh, is not the chiral center in this molecule. So bold and dashed lines don't really mean much there. You have to show it for this. Okay. Uh, three methyl cyclopentanol. So we have an alcohol on the one position, which would be uh, the R configuration. So that drawing this way, the OH should bend up, and the and the methyl group should also be. Let's see. Up, right? That would be the R position here and the S position there. So notice um, cyclopentanol is the parent compound. The OH has to be the number one carbon. Even though it's not listed cyclopentanol, you don't need to do that because it's given that in the ring that has to be the number one carbon. That's the number three carbon where the methyl is. And it's a cyclic compound. And then I asked to draw 2,3-dichloropentane. Okay, and I didn't ask to draw cyclopentane. Okay, that's also a, a mistake that I saw commonly. So be really careful when you're reading the names that you're not putting in things into the name or taking them out that aren't there. There's, it's not a ring, it's just a five carbon chain. All right. I, did, I think I, I should have given credit. If, if you did a ring and you had the right stereochemistry R configurations, I think you got a couple points for that. Um, but this would be what? Um, five carbon chain and the chlorine in this case would be up on the two position and would be up on the three position. Drawn the way I've drawn it. 
so that both are continuous. All right. Okay, here's problem uh, problem five and problem ten because they were similar. One was about oxidation, uh, and one was about reduction. Um, and we talked about the ways in which you can uh, make alcohols by reducing carbonyl compounds or making carbonyl compounds by oxidizing alcohols. And uh, you had to decide which reagent does these transformations. So in this case, we have an alcohol to an aldehyde, and it stops there. So you need a mild oxidation reagent. And this one is the alcohol all the way to the carboxylic acid. You need the stronger oxidation reagent. Uh, and in this case, it's, it's the chromium which does the oxidation all the way, and periodinane which stops at the aldehyde stage. Okay, there's no other way. Periodinane um, would not give the carboxylic acid, uh, and the chromium would not stop at the aldehyde, so there was no possibility for having those any other way. Okay, and the, the reverse of this, the reduction, uh, and I even said here, the carboxylic acid requires the stronger hydride reagent, and we have sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride. Uh, and it was the lithium aluminum hydride which is the stronger one. So you needed that one to reduce the carboxylic acid. So the second one, B, was the only answer. Actually, the first one, everyone should have got a point because A or B would work. Okay, but you can use A without a problem. So there's reduction and oxidation. Uh, and then we have a, a fair number of reactions. So this is the first one of the reactions. And I've shown here various different transformations of alcohols and reagents to use to do that. And I, I think uh, people did a better job at this than trying to predict reactions or fill them in without knowing the reagents. So if we think about this as a... Uh, the first one is a tertiary alcohol, and we're making a tertiary bromide. Um, and in order to do that, we can do this under acidic conditions. And the only, the only reagent in this list that actually has bromide to react um, is D, HBr. Okay, HBr will protonate the alcohol, you'll generate a carbocation, and then the bromide will react with that. Okay. What kind of reaction is that? I didn't put it on this one. I did on the other reaction examples. What kind of reaction mechanism is that? What kind of substitution? <laughs> SN1, because it goes, it makes a carbocation and it's an intermediate. Okay, and then the second one is an elimination. It's also a tertiary alcohol, uh, and the best way to do that, to dehydrate or eliminate, is to use concentrated acid, like sulfuric acid, that doesn't have a nucleophilic counter ion. So the best choice was B to do that, elimination reaction. This is an E1. Now notice what we're doing in this third case. Um, in this case, we're changing an OH group to an OCH3 group. Okay, and there are a couple of ways you could do that, if you think about it. You could generate a carbocation and add an alcohol to it. But to generate the tertiary carbocation, what do you need? You need some kind of acid. You need to protonate it. The only way you can generate the carbocation is to protonate it. So I think some people might have chosen um, methanol, but without that would not do it without an H plus source. Generally, it wouldn't. Uh, it wouldn't do an SN1 substitution without some kind of acid catalyst, which I didn't have there. Uh, however, um, the other way to think about that is actually changing this OH bond for the OCH3 bond. And you can do that using a base 
deprotonate it and then react it with CH3Br. So this was A. And the last one is a primary alcohol, and we can't do that with HCl. Some people might have chosen HCl to do that, but that one wouldn't work. Uh, at least it wouldn't work without a heck of a lot of heat because you can't generate the primary carbocation. Uh, instead, we use SOCl2 to do that reaction, and that's the best way. Okay. Reactions of bromides, and I've listed here uh, these cases. This is an E2 elimination, and I went back too far. There's an E2 elimination, there's a SN2 substitution, and an SN1 substitution. Okay, in this case, we're breaking a carbon halogen bond. Um, a significant amount of heat will do that. I'm focusing on that third one there. Um, let's look at this SN1 substitution. We form a carbocation, and what we're adding then is the sub substituted product. What are we adding to that? The nucleophile is methanol. Okay, so in that case, we should generate a product with OCH3, and that one with the methyl group there, and an OCH3 has to be A. Okay, uh, the second one here is a substitution SN2. So you have cyanide as the nucleophile, and it does a direct substitution with inversion of the configuration. So if the bromine is up, the cyanide has to be down in the product. So it has to be H, not D. All right. This is an E2 elimination. Um, you generate the more substituted double bond, and so B, as opposed to F, should be the product of elimination for that. Um, and this one is simply making the Grignard from where the bromine is. So C was the only answer. Not E, because E has the methyl group in a different place. It has to be C. Okay, so this reaction is of halides. Here's reactions of ethers. This is chapter 8. And again, I've shown um, elimination reaction. I'm looking for the product of an E1 elimination to form a carbocation. Uh, and then notice the other products here, what, what left. The byproduct here is uh, methanol, so it has to be B. The more substituted double bond with methanol as a byproduct. Okay, this one happens to be an SN2 substitution with HI. So where is it reacting? What's happening if you react HI with an ether? The first step, you protonate the oxygen with the hydrogen, right? I'm just going to draw that intermediate here. Then I minus does a substitution. So where does it attack? Does it attack here or does it attack here? Does it attack the methyl group or does it attack the other carbon? And how do you know the difference? Nobody knows? It has to attack the most accessible carbon, right? The one that's the least hindered, the less substituted. And that's which one? Secondary carbon or methyl? Methyl, thank you. <laughs> has to attack the methyl. So what you end up with is the CH3 with the iodine and then the OH on the ring. Uh, without any change to the stereochemistry on the ring, so that has to be this one. Okay, the iodine attacks the least hindered carbon. So the answer to that one, the best answer here was C. That's the product, that, those set of products. Okay. Is it still inversion? 
Um, well, since there's no stereochemistry on the carbon, the iodine actually attacked. I mean, that carbon didn't invert, but it's just three hydrogens, so you don't see anything. The stereochemistry on the ring, since we never broke that bond, that one doesn't change. It's the same thing for the last one here. HBr was exactly the same. The only difference is um, we're adding bromide instead of iodide. Uh, and again, it's attacking the less substituted carbon, not the most substituted carbon. So we get OH up and CH3 bromide as the product. So this one was H. Uh, and this one was just addition of the methyl group to open the epoxide ring. And that would be, uh, which one was that? A. That's the only one with the additional methyl group on it. Okay, any questions? And the Grignard reactions. Grignards to make alcohols. And one of those we started with, I think I had warned you, we'd have something like this. Um, what are the starting materials we need to make the alcohol? So in this case, not in that case, in this case, we have a cyclopentane ring with an OH and a benzene ring, a phenyl group. Okay, so there's only two choices here that start with a cyclohexanone. So we have to add something to the carbonyl with a cyclic ketone. And that, um, what we're adding has to be the phenyl. So it's obviously not the methyl group, it has to be, oops, not that one, it has to be H for this top one. The second one, we could uh, add a phenyl to the, all, the, the acetone. We could add the phenyl group. In other words, we need a ketone with two CH3s. And that's not a choice here, right? There are no examples where we have a carbonyl with two CH3s. Uh, we could add a CH3 Grignard to a carbonyl that has a phenyl and one other methyl. Um, or we could add two methyl groups to something that has a third bond to oxygen. And that's in fact the case that this one had to come from E. That's the only choice. Uh, because again, if you wanted to do it any other way, we'd have to start with that. Have a methyl group on there already. There is an example like that here. But that has phenyl adding, not another CH3. So that wouldn't work, right? So A would, I'm sorry, E was the only possibility. On the other hand, for this one, the only possibility was F, because here we do have a, a phenyl and a CH3 group, phenyl, CH3, and we're adding a second phenyl. So this one has to be F. And this one, the last one, two phenyl groups, and a hydrogen. So that means we have to have a, if we add a phenyl magnesium bromide, then we have to have a phenyl and a hydrogen on there, and that has to be A. I think that's the only choice possible. Okay, any questions on that? And the last one was just the bonus problem, um, just to remind you. I, I'll, what I was looking for is just to say something about sulfur bonds having to be broken and then reformed. Uh, so there are a couple of parts to that. Um, in fact, it's, it's reduced, an SS bond is reduced, and an S, S bond is reformed to do the hair curling. And I know you're all thinking about those great pictures of the hair when you're doing that, right? Okay, that's the test. Um, if you have any questions or you have any um, problems with the uh, it, the grading or it's been added wrong or anything, please come see me after class and uh, we can take a look at that. Okay, so all those reactions um, and, and chemistry that we've just talked about, it, it, it does continue. You've noticed we've talked about addition of greener reagent to a carbonyl. Okay, we've talked about reduction of, to make an alcohol. We've talked about oxidation of alcohols to carbonyl compounds. Um, so we've seen a lot of chemistry of carbonyl compounds already, um, and 
what we'll find when we start talking about specifically more details of these reactions and these, these uh, functional groups is that we're repeating a lot of the same things. As a matter of fact, in this chapter, chapter 9, I don't think there's a single new reaction. Oh, maybe a, a couple of new reactions. But um, in, the, in the first part, first half of that chapter, every reaction in that is from a previous chapter that we've already talked about. So there's nothing really a lot new there. But when we talk about carbonyl compounds, um, we should recognize that there are a lot of different types of carbonyl compounds. We've talked about several of these already. Here's, here's a few more. So aldehydes and ketones is the focus of this chapter. Those are compounds which have a double bond to oxygen and no other uh, group besides a carbon or a hydrogen. So if you have one carbon and one hydrogen, that's what we refer to as an aldehyde. And if we have two carbon groups, whatever they are, if it's two carbon groups attached, those are ketones. Um, and while they have similar reactivity, ketones are a little less reactive if you're trying to add nucleophiles to them. Simply because they're a little more hindered. And alkyl groups are a little bit electron donated. Okay? But we know that the pi bond of a CO double bond is susceptible to being broken by adding nucleophiles. So we'll talk about the polarity and the reactivity of these in a minute. Um, recognize that when we talk about organic molecules and their oxidation states, I think we talked about this quite a while ago, various oxidation states. If you think about an alcohol, Okay. An alcohol right, has one bond from carbon to a more electronegative atom, the oxygen in this case. And we go to molecules which now have two bonds to oxygen, aldehydes and ketones. That's a step up in oxidation state. That carbon of that carbonyl carbon is a higher oxidation state than the carbon of an alcohol. Okay, that's why when we take an OH group and oxidize it to a ketone or even further, that it's an oxidation because we have changed oxidation states. We can go even further though. We can go to a state of carbon which has three bonds to oxygen, this so-called carboxylic acid if it's an OH group. This now has three bonds to oxygen and it's on an even higher oxidation state than an aldehyde or ketone. And it doesn't have to be oxygen. It could be many things there. We could have lots of different functional groups, which is the focus of the next chapter, actually. Chapter 10 is all on the carboxylic acid and related compounds. Um, but to introduce some of those functional groups here, we've seen carboxylic acid. We've seen esters. Okay, This could be a, any kind of carbon group that's an ester. If it's a halogen, these are somewhat reactive compounds. Um, they could be chlorine, bromine, iodine. The chlorides are typically the, the most generally used ones um, in chemistry. But we refer to it as an acid halide or an acid chloride, bromide, iodide. Sulfur is referred to as a thioester. Um, a nitrogen group, it could have two hydrogens or it could have other groups on it as long as it's a, if there's a nitrogen there. These are referred to as amides. Amides which is the basis of all um, protein uh, peptide bonds between amino acids, is one of the nitrogens attaching to the carboxylic acid making chains, polymeric chains. Um, so this amide bond is a key one for uh, all the protein chemistry. Now there are possibilities for having an oxygen in between, I guess I should have put oxygen here instead of X, have an oxygen in between two carbonyls, in which case both of these carbonyls, both of these carbons on either side are bonded to three bonds to oxygen. Okay, so they're both, both sides are at the oxidation state of a carboxylic acid as well. Okay, it's what we refer to as an anhydride. And we'll see more in the next chapter, anhydrides and acid halides have similar reactivities. 
Um, and it's called an anhydride because if you take two carboxylic acids and remove the molecule of H2O, then you end up with this commodity. Okay, so all of those, those are at the oxidation state higher than aldehyde and ketone. Um, alcohol, aldehyde, ketone, carboxylic acids and their derivatives. Uh, but we can go even higher. We can have carbon with four bonds to it, to a more electronegative atom. That could be oxygen, it could be sulfur, it could be nitrogen, it could be a lot of things. As a matter of fact, the same oxidation state uh, of carbonic acid, this is carbonic acid, that's identical to carbon dioxide. Here's carbon dioxide, CO2, four bonds to carbon. As a matter of fact, these are in equilibrium in solution. Uh, urea, two nitrogens, but it's a carbon bonded to four different electronegative, four ele bonds to electronegative atoms. Carbon tetrachloride, similar kind of oxidation state. Carbon bonded to four electronegative atoms. Okay, so recognize some of these, not carbon tetrachloride, but these are also a type of carbonyl compound in an even higher oxidation state. So we have a whole range of different kinds of carbonyl compounds all with varying levels of stability and reactivity, okay, to various things. So what actually gives rise to the, um, the reactivity of a carbonyl compound? It has to do with that CO double bond. So we've seen a lot of chemistry this semester of carbon carbon double bonds. They're relatively nonpolar, right, because they're between two of the same atoms. The difference is when we have a pi bond between a carbon and a more electronegative atom, or any bond between carbon and a more electronegative atom, that's going to be a polarized bond. We've seen in the last cha few chapters carbon-halogen bonds being highly polarized, which is why we can do substitution chemistry with them. There's a plus charge on the carbon, right? and negative charge character on the other more electronegative atom. The same is true for carbon-oxygen bonds, and it's even more true when we have that double bond, because the pi bonds are easier to break than single bonds. So it's a given that a molecule with a double bond to oxygen is going to be more reactive than a molecule with a single bond to oxygen. Okay, And it's polarized towards the oxygen, um, the carbon is the electron deficient N, and the oxygen, more electronegative, is the more negative N, because it's pulling the electron density towards it. And we see this in this electrostatic map. Um, and if we think about uh, a simple carbonyl compound like I've shown here, uh, that happens to be acetone, the three carbon ketone, you can actually draw a resonance form. So let me, let me put on the, of course we know the oxygen in this state has two lone pairs on it, right? So that's the Lewis structure for acetone. But if you take the electrons in the pi bond and just break that bond and push those up onto oxygen, okay, we can draw a resonance form that looks like this. So now there are three lone pairs on the oxygen Okay, we've broken the pi bond, and now we have various charges. So the oxygen gained those electrons, so the oxygen has a negative charge, and the carbon has lost the electrons. The electrons were taken away from the carbon, so there's a plus charge on the carbon. That gives you an idea, the same kind of idea, the polarization of the carbonyl compound. Carbon has a lot of positive charge character, and the oxygen has a lot of negative charge character. Okay. Well, those are resonance forms. So what exists is something in between, but obviously they're not equal contributors, right? The molecule on the left is probably closer to the representation of a, a ketone or aldehyde than the molecule on the right because we've actually separated the charges and broken the bond in, in a sense. <coughs> Okay, but it does illustrate the polarization and where the reactivity is. So if you think about a carbonyl compound, okay, carbonyl compound, 
um, and what it might react with. Of course, the nature of the polarity of this bond dictates its reactivity. So if you were to think about taking a carbonyl compound, let's just say we uh, have it in the presence of some acid source. What would happen in the presence of H plus? Some acid source. You'll protonate. And where are you going to protonate? One of the lone pairs of oxygen. Right? So you can, uh, I should have drawn this a little bit smaller. So you can draw it like this, where you have now three bonds to the oxygen and the formal charge there, but then you can draw the resonance form where you've broken the pi bond, right? And put that plus charge on the carbon. Those are resonance forms of a protonated carbonyl compound. Okay. How do you think that would be the reactivity of this as something that, with a plus charge seeking more electrons? What would be the reactivity of that compared to the unprotonated carbonyl? Should be more reactive, right? You're going to have a lot more positive charge on the carbon when you've protonated it than before you've protonated it. That's a general phenomenon, and what we're going to see is that many reactions, uh, many things that happen with carbonyl compounds result first from protonating the carbonyl with some source of acid and then allowing some nucleophile, uh, even very weak nucleophiles, to, to react with the carbon. Okay, So you react with some acid, it's going to react with the oxygen to protonate it, and then it makes it more susceptible to nucleophilic addition. Um, without that, I'm going to erase this and, and take another look. If we were to take the carbonyl compound, as we've seen before, and react it with something like a Grignard reagent, like phenyl magnesium bromide, which we just saw in the exam, that's a carbon minus and a magnesium, here's magnesium plus, if you want to think about it that way. That's a pretty strong reactive nucleophile. If you have something a really good negatively charged reactive nucleophile, how would it react with a carbonyl compound? It'll attack the carbon that's the most positively charged carbon and break the pi bond. That's right. So this is going to attack that positively charged carbon. The electrons in that pi bond will be up on the oxygen. So and as we've talked about in the last uh, couple of chapters, we'll get this as the initial intermediate. That's true with any good strong nucleophile. And then that O minus could eventually be protonated by the next step by adding some kind of acid. But in that case, we can directly react nucleophiles on the carbonyl carbon, but they have to be pretty strong nucleophiles. And we've seen many examples, and we're going to talk about even more. We've seen examples of hydride nucleophiles from sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride. We've seen examples of Grignard reagents, um, and those were all uh, to make alcohols in the previous chapters. Okay, but that general reactivity holds true for other kinds of chemistry. And in many cases, when we have weaker nucleophiles, we need, we, they won't react directly we need to do them under acidic conditions to catalyze the formation of a product by making the oxygen protonated and the carbonyl more reactive. Okay, so keep those general principles in mind as we talk about um, the reactions of carbonyl compounds. Um, naming, we should cover some of the naming rules uh, for aldehydes and ketones. What you'll see is that there are a fair number of common names for the smaller carbonyl compounds, as it's true with most of the uh, types of functional groups we've talked about. Uh, but the formal systematic name involves taking the parent chain name and dropping the E from the end and adding an AL for an aldehyde and adding an ONE for a ketone. So it does depend on whether it's a a carbon with a, still with one hydrogen on it or not. So if you look at the simplest one, uh, the aldehyde derived from methane is called methanal. But I have never actually used that name except in class because it's formaldehyde. 
That's the common name for this, which I'm sure you've heard of plenty of times before as well. Formaldehyde is methanal, the simplest of all aldehydes. It's the one carbon aldehyde group with two hydrogens on it. So if you have two of them, it's ethanol. Drop the E, add AL. We still have one hydrogen here. Uh, but if you know the two carbon name for this is acetic acid or vinegar, acetic acid, um, you'll notice the two carbon aldehyde group is often referred to as acetaldehyde, as a common name, acetaldehyde. Uh, benzene with an aldehyde group, notice it's not just benzenal because um, we haven't just replaced hydrogens, we've actually added another carbon onto the group. It's a benzyl with a, OA, with a double bond oxygen. So instead of benzal, it's, it, we use the word benzaldehyde. A very common name, benzaldehyde. Uh, and, but that's actually the IUPAC systematic name for that group, which includes the carbon of the aldehyde group. If you're using the name of an aldehyde that is not including this carbon within the name, and benzaldehyde is including the carbon in that name, um, sometimes it's more convenient to call things as a carbaldehyde, which includes the aldehyde group and the carbon it's attached to. So notice um, the benzene ring is a benzene carbaldehyde, if you use that kind of name. You might, you might see that occasionally. Uh, if there are double bonds or other groups, you just add that as well. This happens to be a very common aldehyde used in a lot of different applications from polymers to um, other things as well. Acrolein is the common name, but propenal. Propenal. Okay, it just happens to have a double bond as well. It's not a propanal, it's a propenal. So drop the E typically and add AL, uh, unless you get to some of these more complicated things. Um, al uh, ketones. So again, if we drop the E from the end and added the O-N-E ending. So acetone, common name acetone, a common solvent, uh, is the three carbon group. And it's called propanone. Propanone. Generally, if it's an aldehyde, well, if it's an aldehyde, it has to be at the end of a chain, right? Because there has to be a hydrogen. So there's no, no bother trying to number the aldehyde because the aldehyde carbon is always number one. With a ketone, that's different. That ketone could be many places throughout the chain. Although I don't have to say two propanone because there's only one carbon that's flanked by two other carbons in the three carbon. But once you get to uh, five carbons or more, then you can have different ketones with that, with that carbonyl group in different places. Then you have to give it a number. So for example, this one actually happens to have a double bond and a ketone. Uh, we number from here. So the ketone is on the number two carbon. So that's why it's a hexenone, but hex with the ene on the four carbon and the ketone starting on the two carbon. So we have to insert those numbers. Otherwise, there could be many variations, many different. Uh, constitutional isomers. If there are more than one carbonyl, we can say uh, two ketones, dione. Okay, so that means two ketones. And the numbers, um, uh, and I put it in the front because that's why I've always done it. I don't remember if they can act, should actually go here or not. I don't remember what your book says. I think your book probably has it this way too. But anyway, two carbonyls, one on the two carbon, one on the four carbon. Uh, and that's a pentane dione, a 2,4 pentane dione. Now this actually has a common name. Notice the common name. We'll talk a little bit about carbonyls as substituents. Um, but there's the, the common name for this 2,4 pentane dione is acetyl acetone. Where do you think that comes from? What is, what is acetyl and what is acetone? Well, acetone is the three carbon ketone, right? So what you'll see here in this is that, yes, there is a 
a three carbon, let's just take this one. There's three, there's acetone right there. Acetone. The three carbon ketone. That's part of the structure. Uh, and then there's a group attached to that. This two carbon group, which is a, a carbon with two carbon group we just talked about as an acetaldehyde from acetic acid. That two carbon group as a substituent with the carbonyl there is referred to as an acetyl, A-C-E-T-Y-L, as a substituent. We'll talk a little bit more about carbonyls as substituents. So that's kind of like saying acetyl is a substituent attached to acetone. That's the origin of that common name, acetyl acetone. Uh, I think partly an origin for this, which is um, uh, the name for this uh, molecule, acetophenone. Um, kind of strange, but it's a, a phenyl ring attached to an acetyl group with the ketone group there. So it's acetophenone. This one happens to be a, a benzophenone with two phenyl rings, some of the common names you may see. Okay, so again, Al for aldehyde, always on the end of a chain, so you have one hydrogen at least, uh, and One for a ketone, so it's a carbonyl somewhere in the middle of a chain, flanked by two carbon groups. Okay, as I said, um, sometimes a carbonyl group, like a ketone group, is a substituent on a larger molecule and is not included in the parent chain. Okay, in that case, we have to have ways to uh, describe um, that substituent. So here, for example, when we, whenever we have an acyl group, a carbon with a double bonded oxygen and some other carbon group here, or hydrogen, uh, and it's attached to something larger. That's what that little squiggly line means. That's, that's just a generic a bond to something else, something larger. We call that an acyl group. An acyl. A gen, that's the general word, acyl. Notice the YL ending. So if it's, if it's um, the one carbon group, by the way, the name for this one carbon carboxylic acid is formic acid. Formic acid. So the carbonyl group, if that one carbon thing is attached and it has a double bond oxygen is attached as a substituent, it's called a formyl group. A formyl group. Or as we saw before, a carbaldehyde. Uh, but a formyl group. Uh, the two carbon, as we just saw, is an acetyl group. Um, the benzene ring with a carbon is a benzoyl, benzoyl group. Uh, and anytime you see this YL ending on the substituent, it means there's a carbonyl which is attached as a substituent on something else. Okay, and then there are occasions where sometimes we have a ketone group, which we're not calling the whole carbon group as a substituent, we're just talking about the double bonded oxygen as a substituent. And in that case, we use the term oxo to refer to the double bonded oxygen, just the oxygen part. So notice uh, we have um, we have a, a five carbon. Oops, I only did four carbon, didn't I? One, two, three, four. Sorry, my mistake. Um, we have a four carbon uh, carboxylic acid, which is actually a butanoate. So the four carbon carboxylic acid would be butanone. Oops, I just erased that, darn it. I'm sorry, butyric acid, the four carbon group. But then we have a three oxo. So one, two, three, there's a double bonded oxygen. The oxo is referring to the oxygen being only being double bonded. The carbon it's attached to is part of the butane uh, parentine. Okay, so there are some instances where we're just referring to the oxygen, but as a double bond. If it was a single bond, it'd be an alcohol group. So it'd be an ol, an ol, not an oxo, or a hydroxy group. This is an oxo group. 
as a substituent of something else. And we occasionally see that. So we see the word oxo, think double bonded oxygen as a carbonyl, but it's not including the carbon in the name of that. Okay, any questions on naming these things? Okay, we've seen lots of ways to make these. And uh, this should be nothing new. These are all from previous chapters. So we can, we can make aldehydes and ketones from the alcohols in a number of ways. One of them being oxidation. So if we take an alcohol, in this case a primary alcohol, Here's an alcohol with two hydrogens, okay? And we want to make an aldehyde from that. I'll draw in the hydrogen that's left. So in this case, citronellol to citronellal. We're going to oxidize once. So um, we just talked about this in the exam. What's, what's the reagent we use to do this? That'll stop at the aldehyde? Anybody remember? Well, it was letter B, I think, right? Pariodinane. There are a number of ways to do this. Your book uses pariodinane uh, as a mild oxidant, and it's a good one um, to take a primary alcohol and make an aldehyde. If we use something stronger, like the chromium reagents, what would happen to that alcohol? It would go all the way to the carboxylic acid. Okay, so we have to use something mild, and this is the one, pariodinine. Um, the secondary alcohol here, we want to take the secondary alcohol and make the ketone from it, the cyclopentanone. We want to make the ketone from it. Um, pariodinine probably would work, uh, but since we don't have any danger, there's only one hydrogen on that alcohol carbon, uh, we can only oxidize one, one place up anyway. So we can't go beyond the ketone. So we could actually use the chromium trioxide under acidic conditions. That we don't have any danger of going too far because there are no more hydrogens. Uh, Pariodinane probably would work as well. And um, these are just two examples your book gives for oxidation reagents. It's actually a hundred different uh, oxidation reagents out there that we can choose from and to do various things. But these are common ones. So this is nothing new, right? You want to make an aldehyde, you can start from a primary alcohol and oxidize it to the aldehyde. A ketone, take an alcohol, oxidize it to a ketone. Okay, we can make them a couple other ways which we've seen. This goes back to a couple more chapters. Uh, remember our alkynes chapter? If we add water to an alkyne triple bond, we end up getting hydration, but then it forms the ketone form. So we add two bonds to oxygen by adding water across the alkyne. It's catalyzed by the mercuric sulfate, but it's just an acid uh, addition of water. Okay, so that was one way to make ketones. This is particularly useful if you're trying to make selectively Ketones in the two position where you don't have any other oxygen, you don't have an alcohol there to start with, but the alkynes do that selectively. We can add an acyl group using uh, Friedel Crafts acylation. So you recognize acyl now from way back when we were talking about aromatic chemistry. We've added a ketone group, in this case, an acetyl group, using the Lewis acid, so uh, uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution, right? We use an acid chloride to do that. So now there's those carboxylic acid function groups. We were introduced to them quite a while ago. Can you show the reaction? For that? Yeah, so remember, what does the aluminum trichloride do? In, in Friedel Crafts alkylation or in acylation, it pulls the halide off, right? It pulls the chloride off to make a carbocation. So what happens is the chloride uh, is pulled off and goes to the aluminum, and then we get a carbocation. And I'll just draw it like this. It's actually in the resonance form with that. 
Okay, now we have a really reactive electrophile. So remember what that, whenever we generate a really reactive electrophile, it will add to the benzene ring to form the intermediate cation, and then we'll lose the proton to regenerate the benzene ring. Do you need me to go through that? Okay, that's the Friedel Crafts alkylation or acylation in this case. But this is just generating this reactive, very reactive electrophile. Okay, so those are, those are reactions we've seen before to make ketones. Okay, but what good are aldehydes and ketones? Well, with an aldehyde, uh, as I mentioned, we can oxidize them, and we've seen that reaction before as well. If we do have the chromium reagent, it won't stop, it would be well. Remember, we could start with alcohol here. It won't stop at the aldehyde stage. It'll go all the way to the carboxylic acid. So obviously, if we take an aldehyde and react it with the chromium reagent, it'll oxidize to the carboxylic acid, right? So that's one thing we can do. We can take aldehydes up and oxidize them. By the way, aldehydes themselves are, are somewhat, over long periods of time, exposed to air. Air actually tends to oxidize them to carboxylic acid slow, very slowly. So, um, if you think about having a, a bottle of some aldehyde sitting on your shelf, uh, I, depending on the aldehyde, you know, in a year or so, there's probably a significant amount of carboxylic acid in that bottle, uh, just to let you know. They are prone to air oxidation as well, but this will work pretty quickly. Now, um, I just want to point out one detail of this. If, if you remember, before, when I talked about oxidation, I briefly mentioned a little bit about the mechanism of chromium trioxide oxidation. That in order to do an oxidation, you need to generate, or you need to take something like, if we take the alcohol, right? What you need to do is make the chromium oxygen bond, right? In order to change, to get the electrons to flow away from oxygen. So uh, this actually takes that, that takes that, and that goes to the chromium. Remember, we talked about the fact that you need to have first the OH and then make a bond to the oxidant from the oxygen. Um, if you don't recall, that's what needs to happen. So how do you imagine that happens with the aldehyde? We can see from the alcohol, because we've replaced the OH now with the OCR. Okay, And actually the next oxidation, the oxidation from aldehyde to carboxylic acid also requires that kind of intermediate. But we don't have an OH group, right? We have a CO double bond. Actually, what happens is in order to get to, in order for that to oxidize further, in the aqueous conditions, in the water that's present, there's a reaction between carbonyl groups and waters so that's either acid or base catalyzed. In this case, obviously, we have acidic conditions. Um, but what happens is that there's an equilibrium established between, and this is with this between the aldehyde and another molecule of the same oxidation state, that is where we have added H2O across that double bond. Notice there's still two bonds to oxygen from that carbon. We haven't changed the oxidation state yet. But we now have two single bonds to oxygen instead of one double bond to oxygen. In water, Carbonyl compounds are in equilibrium. Now, the, the nature of that equilibrium depends a lot on the specific structure of the aldehyde. It's probably 99.9% .9 in the double bond form and 0.1% in this, what we call the hydrate form. We're going to talk a little bit about the mechanism for this, but this is the, uh, the aldehyde hydrate. Because we've added, what have we added? We've added a molecule of H2O. 
Um, and then what happens in the oxidation, one of those OH groups gets replaced with an O chromium, and then we form that next double bond. And that's why we get the carboxylic acid. But this is a key intermediate. This hydrate is a key intermediate that happens, which shows something about the nature of the carbonyl groups. Okay? Um, here, for example, if you take a look at this, I've shown two examples, and if you take acetone and, put, and dissolve that in water, acetone is in equilibrium with what we would call the acetone hydrate, the addition of water. That's a reversible reaction. And if you look at the ratio of those two species in the equilibrium, it's 99.9% in the ketone form. Interestingly, if you do the same thing with formaldehyde, formaldehyde in an aqueous solution is about 99.9% .9 in the hydrated form. The carbonyl group does have a significant amount of bond strength, and it's usually a lower energy to be in the ketone form, except in some rare cases. Formaldehyde, when you preserve tissues, it's this hydrated form of formaldehyde, which is, which is actually uh, the solution, uh, the aqueous solution of that. What I want to do uh, next time is talk in detail about the mechanism and the process from converting from the ketone form to the hydrate form and vice versa. Because that's related to a number of other reactions that these uh, carbonyl groups do as well. So we'll talk about that on Thursday.